to introduce to you the director of Dirty Wars, Mr. Richard Rowley. Thank you all, and, and thank you, Sundance. Um, not just the festival for bringing the film here, but the documentary film program here, which has been a huge uh, supporter for us in the film. Um, I want to recognize some members of the crew and supporters who are here with us today. Our friend and executive producer, Scott Roth. Um, our great producer, Anthony Arnaud. Um, Jen Robinson from the Bertha Foundation, who has been a big supporter of this program. And, uh, and Jacqueline Suen, the my comprehend for life and, uh, and the associate producer, assistant camera person, and everything else. It's, uh, it's been really emotional to, for us to see this finally in front of audiences. And it, um, it looks, and it, is, it, it, um, it has a totally different meaning now to watch it from the back of the room with all you seeing it. There's one shot in it uh, in, in Yemen. It's this beautiful little girl who, who looks up and locks, eyes, uh, locks her eyes with the camera fearlessly for a second. And you can see in her pupil reflected um, Jeremy and I standing there, me with the camera and him talking to her. Um, and it always has been moving to me, but to see it now from the back of the room, her looking through us at all of you um, is amazing. Um, because, you know, all, all these people in Yemen, the families, they, and in, and in, uh, people we work with in Afghanistan and Somalia, they all know that you're here watching, uh, that this film is finally seeing an audience, and, and, and they've been contacting us and, and telling us that it means so much to them that, that, uh, that the name of a village like Almanjula has reached the ears of an American audience, and that their story has hopefully reached the heart of an American audience. So thank you so much for giving that to us. Um, does anyone have any questions or, or, I mean, I would, I would also love to know just how people, how people feel. <laughs> Before the movie, you said you were very happy that this finally came to see us. Was that from an economic perspective that was so difficult to make, or was it from a perspective that you felt our government was suppressing your right for free speech? Um, everyone can hear the questions, or should I? Yeah, no, no. Okay. So, uh, so the question was before this. Uh, before when I introduced the film, I said uh, we were worried at times that the film would never get finished. And the question is whether that was because economically it was difficult, or because uh, the, we thought the government was going to try to suppress it and keep it from coming out. Um, I mean, there were every possible kind of uh, of, of, of struggle involved in getting the film out. I mean, you know, financial, of course, it's very difficult to travel all over the world and do this, but we've had amazing support here in the U.S. that's made that possible, including support from Sundance. Um, it was, uh, I think, I think if this film were coming out five years ago, it would be very difficult for us to, to look at it and talk about it. I mean, I think that now, um, ten years into the war on global war on terror, uh, more than ten years in, I think it's finally a moment in our culture where we're, where we're capable of of looking at it and really addressing it. Um, I mean, there are there are other films like Zero Dark Thirty and Manhunt that have come out that are are big in these issues of torture, of uh, of renditions of kill lists um, and drone strikes are are beginning to enter the public debate. Uh, so we were worried more than anything that, that people wouldn't be ready to hear hear this, um, that these stories would be would be too much uh, for us to to, to talk about. Um, and that's why it's been the reception of the film here has been so amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, everything, the, the reviews of it, the, the reception of audiences, the fact that we have a distribution deal for this film now, so it will have a wide cash flow. Mm. Uh, it, it's, it's been completely amazing. Um, is there a woman who, who would like to ask a question? Right there. You, the woman with the glasses. Um, Um, the question is, what, what was the genesis of this project? 
Um, well, Jeremy and I have been war reporters for together for you know over a decade. Um, uh, I mean, I've known him forever, and we we grew really close during the during the Iraq War, um, which was uh, an incredibly traumatic experience for every journalist I know who was who was there and really covering it at the time. And um, when we started this, I mean, I'd been embedded in Afghanistan a lot, uh, and and knew, uh, I mean, could tell how the war was changing in the last couple of years, how the conventional military operations were beginning to be uh, eclipsed by covert operations that we knew nothing about. So I would be embedded, I, I embedded all over the country, uh, and you'd be, you know, with some well-meaning lieutenant who knew nothing about what was going on and would, you know, show, pose for picture ops, photo ops, like drinking tea with tribal elders and digging wells and building schools, and, uh, but all of the kinetic operations were, all of the, the killing and the capturing and the, the real you know, violence of the war was happening you know, outside of our view by units that we, you know, we could never hear anything about. So when Jeremy and I started this, we thought it was just going to be about Afghanistan. It would be about how this covert war was eclipsing the conventional war in Afghanistan and the, you know, the dangers and problems with that. Um, but I mean, we never expected when we came to Gardez um, that we would find out that the unit uh, there would, I mean, you know, that we would, we would end up telling a story that forced us to go to Yemen and Somalia. Um, and we certainly never imagined when we were interviewing Afghan victims of American night raids that we would end up interviewing families of Americans who were killed by these same units. So uh, it began as a story focused on Afghanistan and we never expected the scale of it to reach the point that it did. This lady right here? Yeah. Um, you said there that uh, the civilians, the people in the film, were um, very interested in the fact that there was an American audience that was going to see this. Do they make a distinction between the American military and the American citizens? Or are they all lumped together? Well, I mean, the fact that, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm American, uh, and I was, I was invited into their homes, uh, and, they, and they shared their stories with me. Um, I mean, I think I'm always and have always been everywhere in the world where I go, humbled and amazed at uh, at the the humanity, and the hospitality, and and the and that nuance. I mean, that, that everywhere people are willing to accept you. Uh, I mean, as a human being who isn't a representative of your state. I mean, I wish that we had that same level of. We're able to look at people around the world in that, with that same kind of complexity. The lady off of the center aisle back there? Right there. Um, what can we do if we want to participate in some kind of an effort to uh, try and change U.S. policy? I mean, I think a lot of us thought, oh, we'll go for Obama in 2008 because he's promising to close Guantanamo, end rendition, restore the rule of law, and according to what Jeremy's been reporting on democracy now for years and in this film, it's worse now, if anything. And I thought the pivotal moment in the film was when the whistleblower says, we've invested billions of dollars in this camera, and now the next generation is going to be about finding a nail. And that contrasts with Ron White's total cowardice. So, so what can we do? You know, we have liberals like Ron White who are doing nothing. We have Obama who's made it worse. What can we do? I feel like I loved your film, and I felt feel really like pessimistic and shame. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think at this point, this war has risen above the level of party. It's more. It's not a partisan issue anymore. I mean, these programs began under a Republican administration. They continued under a Democratic administration. And you know, if Romney were president now, they would continue even more. There's not. Um, I mean, it is. Uh, but but these wars have been allowed to continue like this. I, I believe, in part because. They've been conducted in secret. You know, we haven't we haven't known or, or been really fully aware of, of of the scale and scope of what's going on. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a reason why they, there's a reason why they're they're kept secret or why they're hidden in plain sight. Um, because I think the American people will be outraged at, at at some of the things that are being done in their name around the world. Um, so I mean, the answer to your question about how we how we change this is is a is one that. It's a question we all need to be asking, um, and it's one that's, you know, I would be a, an arrogant fool if I, if I had an answer for you for, 
for that now. I mean, it is our hope with this film to make these invisible wars visible and to, and to begin you know, a national dialogue you know, <laughs> on, on every level from the, from the general population up to, to Congress. I mean, uh, Senator Wyden is, I, I mean, he's not allowed to speak. You know, he's, he's one of the few people who actually is, cares about, about this and is, is deeply concerned about, uh, about you know, um, about the, the sort of way that the U.S. Constitution has been rewritten in secret uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, but there's just so few of those people on Capitol Hill. And anyway, I mean, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a movement of people. It's gonna take popular pressure to make anything like that change. We have time for one more question. Gentlemen, or I'm sorry, whoever you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> who, are the, who are the people in the room when you're interviewing Senator Wyden who seem to be kind of in control of what he could and couldn't say? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's his lawyer. Uh, there, there, there's a lawyer who's an advisor. Oh, sorry, the, que the question was who is in the room with Senator Wyden telling him you can't answer that question? So, and the answer is he has an aide who's a lawyer. And, and these, these aides are, are um, actually, they go. Uh, you know, I mean, even when the when the uh, when the senators change, you know, when an election is lost or won, the aides stay there because they're the ones who are most deeply read into all sort of this background. So it's his job to make sure that that Senator One doesn't break the law. Um, if just by I mean, just by acknowledging what everyone in the world knows that the president has authorized the killing of people outside of uh, the stated battlefield of Afghanistan, just by saying that he would be he would be violating his oath, and and you know. Uh, and would be breaking the law. So that's his lawyer or the... Or the it's his lawyer. lawyer. It's his lawyer. He's a Senate lawyer, a lawyer attached to the Senate who works out of his office. Everyone, one more applause, please, for... <laughs>